Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'll just give it a few more minutes while people, um, while I can still see people are trickling into the um, our attendees' room. So we'll just give it a few more minutes and we'll, we'll uh, make a start. See people are still joining. Just that for those of you who just joined in the last couple of couple of seconds, we're just going to give another minute or two just before while uh, while people are still joining. So um, we'll, we'll uh, make a start in there in, in a minute. Okay, I think we're uh, we're two minutes past the hour there. I guess we'll we'll, uh, we'll make a start. And hopefully, um, people who join us in the next couple of minutes will be able to able to catch up. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, I guess, depending on where you are. My, um, welcome to uh, the Global Adoption Week session. My name is Ryan O'Connor. Um, I will just um, I'm sharing my camera now, but what I'll do is just turn it off because I know some people might have issues with uh download speeds and bandwidth speeds and everything. So um, just to put a, a face to the to the uh, disembodied voice that'll be speaking to you for the next couple of minutes. It's okay. So as I was saying, good afternoon or good uh, well, good morning if you're joining us from from anywhere. It's a, a, dreak, a dreak and dreary morning like here it is here in Edinburgh. Uh, welcome to the final day of the um, Research Data Alliance's Global Adoption Week. Our topic today is policy, legal, compliance, and capacity. My name is Ryan O'Connor, and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleague Alexandra Dalipalta. As a way of introduction, I am a research data specialist working at the Digital Creation Centre at the University of Edinburgh, along with Alexandra, who is a research project specialist here at the DCC and also a member of the RDA Secretariat. Today, we're excited to share with you an overview of some of the adoption projects ongoing and implemented at the RDA and provide you with the opportunity to discuss these projects with our speakers. Prior to getting started, I'd like to review a few technical details pertaining to the webinar. Firstly, this webinar is in listen-only mode, meaning that you can hear us and you can hear our speakers, but we can't hear you. This prevents anyone on the line from hearing any unnecessary background noise. Um, you are more than welcome to submit questions to us via the questions box located in the lower half of the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, by simply typing your question, we'll be able to see your inquiry and respond. We plan on taking questions after each of our speakers' presentations, but feel free to type in your question at any time. Alternatively, you can use the raise hand feature. We will then be able to unmute you and you, you can ask your question in person. In case we are unable to answer all the questions that come into us, we will be sure to follow up with you offline. The presentation slides will be made available on the RDA website after the session. Um, we are also recording today's session and a link to this will be shared in the coming days. Uh, just change my slide. Um, so just to give a few words about the objective of this week's sessions. Uh, originally planned as part of the Plenary 15 session, the RDA Global Adoption Week aims to demonstrate the wide variety of RDA adoptable and adopted solutions to the data sharing challenges that people face in their daily jobs. The Global Adoption Week has been organized around five stages of the research data lifecycle, with 10 sessions throughout the week. The, uh, the slides and recordings of all the previous sessions will be made available on the RDA site shortly. Um, we would also like to take the opportunity to draw your attention to the recently published RDA recommendations and outputs catalog, in which RDA outputs are classified as recommendations, supporting outputs, or other outputs. In the catalog, these can be searched according to their status, data lifecycle stage, or scientific domain. Um, back to today's session, um, all three of our presenters today will be 
all three of our presentations even today will be on the adoption of the data seal of approval world data, data system core trustworthy data repositories requirements catalog and procedures these are the culmination culmination of a cooperative effort between the data seal of approval and the world data system of the international science council all under the umbrella of the rda our presenters today are heather lisa from the australian data archive Michaela Lawrence from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, also based in Australia, and Chen Zhu Kui from the National Astronomical Observatory of China. Um, before, we've, before we have our first presentation, we've put together a quick poll just to give, uh, give you an idea of who is in attendance with us today, what their roles are, and what they are hoping to get out of the session. Um, so you see a, um, a, um, a code on screen. If you could go to um, slido.com and enter the code 349 to access the poll. Um, what I will do is I'll just switch my screen um, and I will make my screen uh, full screen. So you just go to slido.com and enter the code W349. So the first question we have today is what is your primary role? So if you can just hit one of the responses here. We can see them taught up. Okay, so a lot of mostly research support staff so far. Just to give an idea of, of people, uh, of the numbers that we, we have today, um, I think around 80 people have attended. Um, I think we usually expect around half of those people um, in the sessions. So just to give you an idea of, of the um, uh, people on the call with us this morning. So yeah, mostly research support staff. Okay, look, some other, uh, some IT specialists researchers oh fine uh, project manager as well okay look let's see a few more responses still coming in i was interested to see these taught up live that closes into organized sport and a lot of us have had in the last couple of weeks okay perfect that's interesting um so i'll just move on to the um next question which is what is your primary domain? So this are social sciences, natural sciences, engineering, technology, medical and health sciences, um, humanities or, and, or domain agnostic. Again, well, sort of similar, I guess, following on from what we saw in the previous, um, the previous question about domain agnostic, always very little humanities people, unfortunately. I'm from a humanities background myself, but always breaks my heart to see the lack of people from humanities backgrounds engaging with these uh, with this type of subject. So it says we can see here a lot of domain agnostic people, natural sciences, engineering, technology, and medical and health sciences. Okay, very good. I still have a few more results just coming in. Okay, that seems to be the, about it. And I'll just go on to our third question, which is, what is your country of residence? Just to give people an idea of um, where their co-attendees or fellow attendees are, are coming from today. The US. Oh, there's a lot more Europe than I thought. Oh, oh, oh there we go. Australia, a lot of Australia. Not from France. I guess it was an early morning start in France. Same, same for us here in, uh, in Edinburgh. Of Australia, Germany, Italy, Spain, UK, US, Denmark, Catalonia. As, as expected, a lot of um, Australian attendees here with us today. And people from the UK as well. Interesting. Okay, very good. I will just go on to our final question, which is. I'll find my. So what is the one question or issue related to data policy, legal complaints and capacity and the RDA outputs that you would like to learn more about today? So this is just a free text box. Um, you can just enter in what your kind of the key issues you're hoping to take away from today's session. Um, you can enter in more than you can put in more than one um, more than one issue. If you like, there's a couple that you can make it a, num uh, a number of entries. So it always takes a little bit longer. People have to think up some free text on the spot. No answers so far. Oh, here we go. 
So we have the application of licensing. Interesting. Yeah, that's what I guess is a good, probably a good um, weapon here to be in attendance to. GDPR. We have legal issues related to health data. We have any more responses? Okay, sensitive data implications. I'll just wait to see if we have any a uh, couple more responses on this one. Okay, it seems like that's, that's the um, but the some of the um responses we'll get for that. Oh, it's good to see just get get an idea of what other people are um are expect are attending the session for and what they're expecting to or what they're hoping to find out about. Um, okay, look. So what I'll do, I'll just switch my screen back. So um, now I'll just hand over to our first presenter, who is Heather Leeser. So Heather is a data archivist with the Australian National Australian Data Archive, as I said, at the Australian National University, where she is responsible for the curation of research data for preservation, archiving, and publication. So what I'll do now, Heather, I'll just make you a presenter. Um, here we go. Um, and you should be able to getting a message to share your screen now. There we are. And I will start my slideshow. Perfect. Yeah, I can see your um, your PowerPoint. You're good to go. All righty. So if that looks okay, I will go ahead and get started. Like you said, I'm yeah. Heather. So good day from Australia. So that should cover um, all different aspects of time of day. Um, the Australian Data Archive as a trusted repository for research and data sharing. Uh, during this RDA Global Adoption Week, I'm going to give you a quick background of what the Australian Data Archive is, the reasons that we undertook the Core Trust Seal, or at that time it was the Data Seal of Approval in the World Data System Joint Venture, and the outcomes and our next steps. So the Australian Data Archive was started back in 1981 at the ANU in the Research School of Social Sciences with a mission to collect and preserve Australian social science research data. We still have the same mission, but we are now in the Center for Social Research and Methods at the Australian National University. We hold over 5,000 <clears throat> 5, data sets from around 1,500 studies. We are sourced from academic, government, and private sector and NGO. So you can see here some of the data holdings that we do hold. We hold panel data, we hold health data, we hold longitudinal data, we hold sensitive data, and we hold it on a varied and variety of topics. Um, anything that can pretty much fit into the social sciences will be found in our, our archive. So who are our community group or our users? We have over 2,500 new users each year. And in 2019, we had 25,000 data file downloads. These were from undergraduates, postgraduates, academic researchers, um, the media, government, and NGO sectors. Predominantly, we are covering the Australian universities, but we do have some international university users in there as well, as well as government departments um, in their new ventures to share data are finding it useful to go through the Australian data archive. So I'll move on to the core trust seal now. So the Core Trust Seal was undertaken as a project with the Australian National Data Service, or ANS, which is now the Australian Research Data Commons, and the ARDC is a member of the RDA. So we used this opportunity with ANS, or ARDC, to undertake the Core Trust Seal and see how it was for our um, archive, as well as how it fit for the Australian context for the social sciences. So this work, as I said, was undertaken in a joint venture with ANS um, and had multiple phases. We did contracting with ANS. We did the assessing of our criterion for what started out as the data seal of approval. Um, we assessed what documents we actually had at that time and which ones were in the public domain and which ones were out of the public domain. We were already a close to 40 year old um, archive at that time, but many of our applications and policies were not in the public domain. We also assessed what could be safely and legally placed into the public domain. 
We also assessed the agreements and with our outsource partners and tried to figure out how to demonstrate some of these. As some of these, we didn't have a solid agreement. We just had an in within university agreement. Um, we completed the core trust seal application and assessment, which took multiple um, toing and froing with our assessors, but we got there in the end. Um, and then we have outlined some changes that needed to be implemented by the end of that to ensure that we were fair, five safe, and have continued um, certification. So the challenges we found in our process undertaking the core trust seal was there was a complex interplay between the guidelines and the relevant documents and trying to figure out which document needed to be placed in more than one um, <clears throat> guideline or not at all. We also had to figure out how to provide the evidence from things that weren't necessarily in the public domain and if they needed to be in the public domain, the safest way to put them there. We also needed to figure out what constituted a risk management assessment as we had done risk management through our university, but this assessment was not available or visible from outside sources. We have um, also had the challenge of determining the in-process timelines of implementation um, for each of the guidelines. If you didn't have something in the full implemented, implemented phase, you needed to um, provide a timeline. And we really needed to negotiate within our own organization what was going to be a realistic and reliable timeline for um, putting some of these implements in place. So nine of our 16 guidelines required some edits during the process. Some of these were just updating web links. Some were actually updating our website. Um, many of the external um, outsource partners, their web links fell, fell off the uh, radar while we were undertaking the application. So some of the changes that we implemented at the Australian Data Archive. We determined that our platform that we had been currently using, the Nestar platform, was no longer going to meet our needs with, within the core trust seal um, certification process. So we decided to change to a Dataverse platform, which is run out of Harvard. Um, so we now have a community-based um, Dataverse platform. And we also updated our website. So our website predominantly only includes static links, um, and then our Dataverse platform is where all of our data is. We also had to update a lot of our documentation due to changing from our Nestar to Dataverse platform. We also changed some of our service platforms for our repository, such as we implemented OZ ticketing system to help us track the tickets um, or the, the applications through Dataverse and through our email. So this is what our new website looks like. Um, it has a link to our Dataverse account as well. Then each aspect in the Dataverse account has a data set page. And each one of those, like in Nestar, still has DDI documentation um, for all of its metadata. There are data and document files available for all of our studies. There is metadata available in, in the form of DDI for abstracts, um, data collection types, other aspects, um, authors' names. There's also a terms and conditions of use and access requirements tab that lays out the legal framework of what you are agreeing to. And there's also a versioning step in Dataverse, which was very handy and helpful. Also, the DOI is minted in Dataverse and a citation is given as the example is below. So this is what the front page of the Australian Data Archive Dataverse looks like, and that's the, the link for it, dataverse.ada.edu.au. And you can search on multiple different aspects in there to find all of the data that we hold. And all of the Nestar data has been moved into our Dataverse um, account now. So inside Dataverse, you will actually see that we have the options of having completely open access so that you can just download without having to log in to Dataverse. Um, so mostly we just have download for documentation and acknowledgements um, and free, freely available publications. But some data sets are starting to go to an open data set as well. 
we are still working with this um, on agreements and license structure. Most of our data sets are still request access because they are mediated access. So we still at least want to know who is using it. Then this will, once you put in a request, it will link to our Oz ticket and um, send us an email notification saying that there is a application waiting. It will also send the user an application, uh, a copy of their application. So the benefits that we have found from undertaking the core trust seal was it really gave us a time to reflect on ourselves and have a refinement of our own processes, policies, and procedures. Even though we were almost a 40-year-old archive, we hadn't taken that new perspective that the core trust seal had given us the opportunity to take. So we refined our processes, our policies, and procedures. We've looked at international standards and international compliances. We've helped, we had trust from a core set of users previously, but this really gave us the opportunity to grow that trust to other user communities and other contributors that may not have uh, looked at the Australian Data Archive before. It's also given us a network of users from inter internationally through the RDA. So it has also given us the ease of access to information for those people who are thinking of contributing to the archive of what kind of information we need from their ethics, their grants, their participant information. It also gives users that same information to allow them the idea if they want to use that data set. And this really relates back to the data lifecycle and the data management plans that researchers and government bodies are very keen on implementing. So our next steps, um, we're going to continue to develop our new functionalities of a self-deposit um, dataverse, which is ensuring fair and trust principles um, and integrating that self-deposit dataverse with our forward-facing production dataverse. We are working with new collaborators and on new collaborations all the time. Some of these are mapping gray materials to data that already exists in our data archive, um, such as was mentioned in another study um, in this RDA adoption week. We are also looking at all of the implications of open data access, so completely open, not having a mediated access, and which data sets that is safe and viable for, and which ones it is definitely not safe and viable for. Some of our um, data is very, very restricted, um, very sensitive data, so it can never actually go to a fully open data access plan. It will need to be mediated as we need to know who is utilizing it. We're also working with API access, so both for deposit access, running shiny applications, and R applications. We're also looking at shibboleth authentication for university users and ORCID identification um, integration. So further steps to take. We're still rapidly uh, assessing all of our business rules for refining business rules with our current users and future users. We are also refining the outsource partner agreements and arrangements that we have in place, um, as I said, Many of these are within a university, so are more on a gentleman's handshake or met within a university context. So trying to find ways that we can solidify those. Um, we are also working with the approvals of management in Dataverse and linking this to our OZ ticket so that our communications between the ADA, our users, and our data owners are managed and utilized in a safe and effective way. We are finding ways to link into the FAIR principles and the five safe models to help streamline our access um, and our utilization of data. We're also undertaking and keeping compliant on licensing in terms of terms of use. Um, we are looking at other repositories around. We're looking to RDA, finding out the most relevant and most recent um, compliances and making sure that we can still engage with those. We are also looking to make sure our provenance, so our metadata tabs and our controlled vocabularies are meeting international standards and standards within the Australian context. Um, we do have a few controlled vocabularies, but we're working to solidify quite a few of these. 
We're also trying to keep abreast of the common standards, such as the data documentation initiative. Um, our supervisor, um, Steve McEachern, is very active in the DDI community. And we're also, of course, looking for recertification coming up in February of next year. So that is it for my presentation. But if you have any further questions or you would like to come and see our Dataverse or our website, please have a look. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thanks. Back, thanks, Heather. Um, I'll, I'll leave you. I'll leave the control to you just for a few minutes just while you, uh, if, um, when you're answering any questions. Um, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, to any, anybody who wants to ask a question, uh, feel free to submit it in the questions box. Um, we have one question so far for you, Heather. So this is from uh, Leia Stukhar, um, she, who asks, uh, for ADA, do you use DDI for all studies? Yes, we currently use DDI for all studies, um, and we used DDI back in our Nest Star implementation as well, and we have carried that forward. Um, I can't think off the top of my head which DDI standard we are up to in our Dataverse, um, but we are definitely keeping abreast of DDI, and I know DDI is also doing some new implementations to make it a broader um, application for all areas. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, so, so far, I don't see any other questions yet. Um, I'll just give a, a couple of seconds if anyone else is, if anyone's typing a last minute uh, question in. Uh, or is any, if anyone has their hand raised, um, which I will just check. And no, so nobody has their hand raised so far. Oh, and we have a, another question. So, this is from um, from Gwen Moncoif, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, who, who asks, uh, how much time and resource did it take to get to the stage you're at? Well, it's a very complex question um, because each archive has a different um, level of knowledge or a different level of availability of the documentations that may be needed. Um, it took us a bit longer because we did find many of our documents were inwards facing. And at that time, we were also starting it under the Data Seal of Approval World Data System Joint Venture, which has now become the Core Trust Seal. So it did take a bit longer while that teething process was being worked out as well. So it, it did take us almost a year from when we initiated to when we were um, awarded our seal of approval. But that that process is getting faster um, now that they actually have a, a, a better board and um, larger pool of uh, people to review. Um, our next review is due in February, I think it is. Um, and we've started to undertake the assessment already, but we're only working on it an hour a week right now looking if there's anything that we need to um, have updated from last time that we haven't updated to this time or making sure web links are um, are viable. Perfect. Okay, okay. Um, so one more question. So this is from Alex Freeman, or sorry, Alice Freeman, who asks, um, what is the most valuable advice you would give, uh, you would have liked to know before applying to Court or Seal? Um, was to know what can safely be and what is in the public domain. So that takes the longest, is figuring out what aspects of policies, procedures, things of your archive are already in the public domain. Um, because like I said, we were a very established archive and we had trust with our current users, but many of our documents were only internally facing for our own processing procedures. Um, but these did need to actually be externally facing so that users understood and the assessors could understand what exactly we were doing. Okay, perfect. Thanks, I think Heather. also uh, understanding who your user group is as well, if they will, if your user groups or your governments or your institutions want you to have this trust. If so, then it's a good thing to undertake. Okay. 
Perfect. Thanks, Heather. Um, okay, so I think I'll just have just time now to move on to our um, to our next presenter. Thanks again, Heather, and thanks for everybody for submitting their questions. So, um, Michaela, I will move on to you. I will just move make you um, a presenter. So you should be getting a message um, now to make to share your screen. If you could um, also, if you could make sure to to share your slides in a kind of full presentation mode, just so people can see them up close. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks for that, Ryan. My name's Michaela Lawrence, and um, I work with uh, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation, um, or referred to CSIRO, um, throughout this presentation. So CSIRO is a trusted organisation that undertakes research of fundamental importance in Australia. The research produces data that CSIRO manages over the long term, enabling reuse as inputs to new research. Um, our RDA adoption story was to certify our institutional repository, the data access portal, or the DAP as we call it, as a trusted data repository with the core trust seal. Our repository infrastructure and software is developed and maintained by our, our information technology department in-house and it has been in production since 2012. The DAP ranges from large data from telescopes to small data in the kilobytes and it covers a wide range of scientific di disciplines of our CSIRO staff. Uh, the project was supported by the Australian National Data Service, um, or now called the Australian Research Data Commons, and they're a member of the RDA, and their initiative for the Australian Research Community for Data Intensive Infrastructure, Platform Skills and High Quality Data Collections. The project investigated the potential for the DAP to provide trustworthy access to significant data assets. And in addition, we investigated the potential to host data owned by third parties with whom we collaborate. And we adopted um, the output from the repository order and certification catalogue um, from the RDA WDS certification of digital repositories interest group. So there were four phases um, of our certification process. So understanding the certification process, such as the requirement for public documentation as evidence and the 16 requirements to be addressed in the application. Uh, we then gathered our internal documentation and sought advice from staff within the Information Technology Department and other areas of CSIRO. We brought together our internal documentation by developing preservation and collection de development principles to meet the public evidence requirements of the certification process. And addressing the 16 requirements in the application was done throughout the project, but we did a final tidy up and links to the evidence before adding the content into the or trust your submissions system. It took about eight months to complete the application. Um, however, the data seal of approval, which we were originally looking at, um, closed during the project. And then we submitted our application to the new certification organisation, the core trust seal in February, 2018. After a draft, Addressing the reviewers' feedback, the DAP uh, received certification in October 2018. So we had two data librarians working about full time on the project. Um, and we also had um, a range of staff that we drew on throughout the project. So the DAP developers, and infrastructure team who um, store the data um, for the DAP. Uh, IT st operations staff about business continuity plans. And for the second part of the project around hosting third party data, our legal department helped develop policies and 
procedures. And we also engage with some of our researchers and their external collaborators to test those procedures. Why was hosting external data part of our project? Um, we'd had um, interest from researchers in investigating using the data access portal to bring together significantly significant data from a range of organisations for the benefit of industry policy and research. So gaining certification of the DAP as a trusted data repository would pro provide an added incentive in that um, area. And as an in institutional repository, we needed to develop policies and processes for hosting third party data. So as our legal counsel defined the scope for accepting data within our collection development principles. And she also developed an agreement outlining the terms and conditions and the obligations of CSIRO and the third party in hosting the data in the DAP. Adopting the RDA output provided the opportunity to assess the DAP's policies and processes against an international common catalogue of requirements. We identified our repository had many areas of strength um, and for future planning, we identified that our disaster recovery process needs further work. Developing the procedures to host third party data had immediate benefits with helping researchers address funder needs. And also we had researcher feedback about the value of certification when they discuss their software that's available through the DAP with their clients. Uh, and it's been a fantastic develop, professional development opportunity. Uh, and I've just started uh, as a review with the core trust seal. So increasing my knowledge of the many ways repository work, repositories work. Also the ARDC has developed a community of practice in Australia to encourage other repositories to get certified. So lessons learned. So using available resources to developing understanding of requirements um, so we looked at other applications, webinars on the Core Trust Seal site and professional networks. And applying for the um, Core Trust Seal management tool early is a good practice um, as you get to understand the end process earlier. Uh, drawing on expertise within CSIRO and finding the business continuity plan um, was already available, meant that we didn't have to reinvent documentation. And having procedures for hosting third party data led to a greater understanding of the risk management and legal framework for depositing data in the repository. And it provided confirmation that our policies and processes are aligned with good practice. So in 21-2022, um, we'll be recertifying with the Core Trust Seal. And um, there was one area where we had, didn't have full implementation and that will, uh, will be the disaster recovery plan. Uh, another area that we've looked at from the data versioning working group is implementing um, their recommendation uh, to remove metadata versioning. We're also investing, investigating metrics from FAIR, the FAIRS FAIR project um, from the FAIR data maturity model working group and also um, investigating using the DAP as an instrument register from the Persistent Identification of Instruments Working Group. And that was it, thank you. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the staff in CSIRO who are involved with the project, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, thank you Michaela. Um, 
So yeah, just to remind everybody that the um, you can submit your questions for Michaela into the questions box. Um, I'll also remind you that the, there, uh, there are um, adoption stories for all f uh, three of the presenters today on the RDA website. Um, when the next pr um, presentation starts, well, I'll, I'll post the link in the chat so you can you all have a, a direct link uh, to it. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions so far. You can also um, attendees if you want to raise, if you want to ask a question in person, feel free to raise your hand. Just scrolling through the list here, I don't see any uh, hands raised so far. Um, as I said, if you wanted to ask your question to Michaela after the um, once we once we start the next question we'll, or the next presentation, we'll um, we'll forward on the questions and the contact details. So feel the it's not the uh, last opportunity to do so. We'll also be sharing the slides for um, all the presentations later. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing any questions here. So what I'll do, I will just... Um, oh, we have one question. Yeah, just as I was about to change. So Michaela, there's a question here for you. Um, could you please talk to us about rem uh, removing metadata versioning? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so with our current system, we actually uh, version each um, any metadata changes and within the recommendations from the working group is that um, you only version the, any changes to the data. Um, so what we will be doing is rather than um, having a version for each metadata change, um, our DOI um, will change um, for each of the versions where files um, are changed with um, each version. Sorry, <laughs> that's too many versions. Oh, that's okay. That's, um, sorry, just to mention as well, that, that question, the last question was from, from Paula Martinez. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll just have a quick scan through if there's any hands raised from anybody. Any of the, we have uh, 30 plus attendees uh, in, in with us today. Um, okay, so what I'll do now, I'll just transfer the um, the screen sharing to Chenzu. Thanks again for that, Michaela. Um, and I will just, Chenzu, I'll just transfer the screen to you and it'll ask you, should be a dialogue box asking you to make a presentation. If you could also just make sure to share your um, your screen as a full screen. Yep, yeah, exactly like that. That's perfect. Thank you. So just to, to introduce Chenzu, Chenzu is Chenzu Kui from for our final presentation today. He's a project manager for the Chinese Virtual Observatory. So over to you, Chenzu. Okay, thank you, Ren. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon and uh, good morning. Yeah, uh, my title is improving data management uh, um, procedures based on the CTS certification. Yeah, uh, as mentioned uh, by our uh, last two speakers, first uh, I will give a brief introduction about the CTS. The CTS uh, launched uh, in 2017 and defined the requirements and offers our level certification for trustworthy data repositories, a holding date, a long-term preservation. The CTS is a cooperative effort between the DSA and the WDS, World Data System, uh, of the International Science Council, WDS. Yeah, uh, the umbrella uh, of the CTS is RDA. The uh, CTS uh, provides 16 requirements for the uh, proposal the, uh, repository and currently there have been 150 uh, repositories passed as a CTS certification. Below is uh, uh, six, uh, 16 requirements for the repositories. From these uh, re requirements, we can say CTS is a very uh, comprehensive uh, very complex uh, system for our uh, repositories. If you you just uh, follow these requirements, you your re repository will get very good uh, or solid uh, workstations. So uh, 
This time, I will not introduce you the CTS contents in detail. Here is a brief history of a Chinese astronomical data center. The data center is based on a World Data Center for Astronomy, WDC for Astronomy, which is hosted at the National Astronomical Observatory of China and has been providing data services to users since its initiation in 1989, 31 years old. Yeah, yes, 31 years ago. And in 2012, the CASDC became a regular member of the new created WDS. And in October 2018, CASDC passed the CTS certification. Uh, we are uh, the 33 maybe uh, certified repository uh, yeah, for, for the CTS system. And uh, we also, the first one, the first repository in Asia passed the uh, CTS certification. This is uh, our old uh, web page for the WDC, uh, WDC area. Now we are in the WDS and RDA area. Here is the current uh, status for our data center. From the uh, left uh, up image, you can see the observatories distribution uh, from the National Astronomical Observatories in China. Uh, the observatories uh, covers the mainland of China, uh, the Antarctic, uh, our South Africa, and even uh, on the moon, uh, about uh, 40, about 40 observatories or uh, instruments around the globe. And uh, taking advantage of the uh, public uh, cloud computing system, the CSDC, the data center system, uh, provided a global infrastructure for our users. Uh, we have seven nodes, uh, cloud computing nodes in mainland of China. And uh, uh, we also work uh, works together with uh, Alibaba Cloud. Alibaba Cloud is the uh, uh, third largest uh, uh, public cloud computing provider, uh, just following uh, Amazon uh, and uh, uh, Google. So the so CASDC uh, act as roles for repository means the uh, data center for long-term uh, preservation for scientific data. At the same time, the CASDC is also a SaaS platform. In astronomy, we initiated the virtual observatory concept uh, almost 20 years ago. So it is a, a, an online working environment now we call science platform. Here is a web page for the current version. Last year, the CASDC was endorsed by the Chinese government as one of the first 20 national scientific data centers. We have a new name, National Astronomical Data Center, NADC. Uh, from the uh, from the rules of the government, NADC uh, has the following responsibilities. For example, uh, date collection, long-term curation and the preservation, date uh, applications and the utilizations, uh, data sharing and open uh, access to the world, and uh, international collaborations with other uh, data centers uh, from other countries. Uh, from other uh, research fields. Uh, on the right hand, you can see the architecture for the NAOC because NAOC, uh, NADC, because NADC is, uh, is, is serving the astronomy uh, community. So our data source are mainly from uh, telescopes, uh, observatories, and the simulations, of course, 
we have uh, many uh, data size catalogs from uh, papers for the research papers. And uh, we uh, be taking advantage of the advanced uh, IT infrastructure, for example, the uh, high speed network, uh, computing, uh, storage resources, and the cloud computing. Uh, yeah, we have the strong IT infrastructure. Uh, above level is the resource connection layer. We will uh, we will use the uh, virtualization uh, technicals, for example, the cloud computing and uh, currently the Docker technologies. We will link uh, the different hardware resources, software resources uh, together. As a, a whole system, and about that is a data fusion layer. Data fusion layer we will uh, provide a, a uniform metadata system, provide a uni, unified identification system, so so that different kinds of data from different resources can be act as a whole system. And about that layer is the uh, application and mining layer. We provide uh, um, SAS, means service, as a service uh, from the cloud computing uh, uh, community. We provide uh, data analyzing, uh, data mining, machine learning, uh, parallel uh, computing, uh, streaming processing, yeah, different kinds of application services. Above uh, that is a sharing and survey uh, serving layer uh, ending to the uh, facing to the end users. We will provide a web from the uh, interfaces, uh, applications, uh, mobile phone applications, and the deep command line interfaces, deep, yeah, different interfaces to our end users and our client uh, pro programs. And of course, uh, at the right hand of the architecture, you can see we have. Uh, a whole set of standards, regulations, policies. Yeah, from the whole architecture, we we can see the uh, almost uh, all the uh, CTS requirements are covered, and uh, we are facing for better and better uh, satisfaction to the CTS requirements. Here is a uh, uh, some uh, potential benefits. Uh, inside the National Scientific Data Center uh, community, because this is uh, one of the first uh, national scientific data centers. Before that, the NADC, the CS, the CSDC is a community initiated data center. Now we are the national level scientific data center, similar to an, an ANDS system. So we can get long-term operation and uh, uh, stable uh, fundings. Uh, currently, at least uh, to, to uh, 20, uh, 25, we will have stable funding support. And at the same time, the National Scientific Data Center community is a DC plenary uh, community. Uh, other uh, data centers, including agriculture, us, uh, system science, space science, uh, genomic, uh, polar science, high energy physics, uh, biology, and, and uh, some others. So it, it, inside the community, we can share our experience and share our, our lessons. Uh, currently, uh, since NADC is the first one to pass the CTS certificate, we have shared our experience to these centers, how to apply, uh, how to prepare documents for the CTS uh, certification. And uh, the NADC, uh, we have some uh, unique uh, characters. For example, it is a national and the institute level, did, uh, uh, the, the national and the institute level uh, data policies will act as our umbrella. For example, the national uh, laws uh, will ask uh, data archiving, 
uh, for research projects and uh, for the academic papers you published you you should archive your data uh, to the national uh, data center and uh, you have the requirements you have the responsibility to provide your data uh, to a national data center for long-term reservation and open uh, access uh, to the users and uh, the national data center will act as a full life cycle management system we will act uh, as a one-stop all-in-one uh, for our end users uh, you, you you can uh, yeah upload or archive your uh, paper data or your observational data uh, to the platform and we will provide you uh, management uh, uh, environment uh, processing and analyzing and then uh, public publish your uh, results uh, to the users and the system will show different types of in, uh, of users uh, from the telescope team for our observers for our scientific teams uh, scientific users and the education and the public outreach users uh, of course we are also serving the uh, managers and the uh, police funding policy officers the national um, astronomical data center is an application driven but not a technical architecture driven system we have to sell different uh, astronomical uh, products uh, and uh, telescopes and the users so uh, during our serving process we will improve uh, the level of our uh, management uh, for uh, date uh, management uh, preservation and uh, our cloud computing and science platforms. And just uh, several days ago, we released a new uh, website uh, for the NADC. Here is a, a Chinese version. The English version will be available in the near future. Uh, you can uh, browse to the website at any time and your uh, comments and recommendations are very welcome. Yeah, here is, uh, are two examples for the CTS adoption in the NADC system. Based on the CTS, we provided a whole lifecycle management uh, platform for our users, for our different users. For example, for the uh, astronomical observation, uh, you, yeah, the system provided the observation proposal submission, uh, the observation, so the observation tools, uh, data processing, data archiving, and the data release to the public. And for the end users, uh, we provide data usage, data processing, uh, data management. After you uh, get your scientific results, yeah, uh, we provide. We also provided a, a paper data repository. Paper data repository uh, means uh, when you public uh, publish your scientific data, the related uh, catalog, the related uh, software codes, uh, and maybe some movies. Yeah, you need uh, upload to a persistent uh, system for a long term access. So. This is one service for end users. We will provide a DOI uh, identification for your results, for your paper related data. Uh, backend of the platform is a whole a uniform metadata management system. Our uh, resource metadata includes data resources, uh, paper resources. From data, we uh, they have different kinds of data sets. For example, uh, catalog, image, spectra, uh, and others. Uh, we have a whole system for uh, review uh, for the uh, metadata system after you, after the user upload the metadata for our for their data sets. We have a, a detailed check for their uh, metadata information. And after uh, his uh, passed the uh, check, uh, 
this paper is accepted by a journal, so we will assign a DOI uh, identify, identifier uh, to the data source. Yeah, here are some experience from the NADC. Uh, in my last slides, I also mentioned uh, NADC of the Chinese Astronomical Data Center is also a member of the International Virtual Observatory Islands. Uh, IVOA is an organization that debates and agrees on the technical standards that are needed to make the virtual observatory possible. The vision of VO virtual observatory is made possible by the standardization of data and metadata, uh, by standardization of data exchange methods, and by the use of a registry uh, which lists available services and what uh, can be done with them. The IVOA uh, is created in 2002, and currently uh, IVOA has uh, 21 national members and an uh, international uh, project. It has uh, six working groups and uh, eight interest groups. Uh, you can see the logo family group, uh, logo uh, family picture uh, at the uh, left top, uh, of the right top. Uh, the IVOA has been informed about the RDA activities since the beginning of the I RDA, in, in particular through IVOA data curation and preservation interest group. And the CTS uh, certification topic has been discussed uh, in the IVOA. Uh, last month at uh, IVOA main uh, interoperability virtual meeting, uh, the recommendation of the RDA did maturity model working group and its consequence for astronomy was also discussed uh, in, inside the uh, IVOA community. So uh, my conclusion is uh, CTS and RDA provide a, a valuable uh, frame, uh, framework and a, a whole set of requirements, guidelines for the repository for um, mm, not only for astronomy community, but for the whole uh, scientific data community. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you, thank you, Chenzu. Thank you um, for that presentation. Um, just a reminder to everybody: if you'd like to submit a question for Chenzu, just please um, please do so now in the into the um, questions box. And also check if if anyone wants to ask a question in person, feel free to just raise your hand, and we'll be able to um, to unmute you. Uh, well, we'll just give people a minute or two to um, type up any questions or raise their hand. Um, I just posted into the chat previously um, just a link to uh, the adoption stories for the to the court for the three presentations today. There's also a number of um, other um, court adoption stories to do with the court or seal in that link. Um, but the contact details for all of our the, all three present uh, presenters today are within those um, adoption stories. So as um, they're all happy to, to uh, uh, answer any questions that you might have afterwards if, if uh, something occurs to you sort of um, after the fact. I'm sure that'll be fine. I'll just double check the um, questions box here. We've no questions so far and um, no hands raised so far from what I can see. Um, okay, I'll, um, I'll just have a few, one or two more slides that I will um, I will share. Thank you again, Chenzu, for your for the presentation. And I'll just take control of the screen. Okay. I'll just, if I can um, find my, here we go, dialog box. All right, I'll just make myself organizer and hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, so yeah, just a, just a minute or two before we wrap up. I know we've just gone a, a few minutes over time. Um, we'd just like to share with you a few more things to do with um, RDA adoption. As I said at the outset, the uh, Global Adoption Week is an opportunity to learn about the wide variety of RDA outputs and recommendations and to engage with adopters on their experiences and lessons learned from implementation. The RDA is actively seeking new adoption stories to inspire further uptake of RDA outputs. Um, if this is of relevance to you, you can submit your story on the RDA website, or if, the, if you want to see any other the um, adoption stories, feel free to just um, on the main landing page of the RDA site. There's a link to the uh, to the adoption stories, and there's there, there's a few more even in um, in the pipeline at the moment. So those are constantly being um, being added to. Um, 
Finally, we would also like to draw your attention to the CoData Data Science Journal for, the special, for their special collection on RDA. Um, this special collection is aimed to give visibility to research results and outcomes stemming from the RDA activities. Um, it's, pu it's published now and available now, so, um, uh, it include, and it includes papers describing the latest, latest results of RDA working in interest groups and associated use cases that highlight the added value that RDA has in, uh, of added value of RDA work in uh, related fields. Um, also, the RDA Europe 4 project is currently supporting the publication of 30 articles in the special collection. Um, as part of that project, there are still funds available to cover the um, article processing charges, and uh, we have recently extended the call for papers until July 17th. Um, and just for for um, for the uh, for the audience today, that this is open to all interested uh, applicants, regardless of geographical provenance. So that that doesn't just have to be um, of relevance to um, RDA activities or uh, um, stories outside, or um, it doesn't have to be just within Europe. Any 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 um, any um, applicants can make a um, submission. Um, okay, so that just that, I'll just turn back on my camera. So that looks like we've um, we've run out of the time. I'd just like to thank again our three presenters, so uh, Heather, Michaela, and Chenzu, and I'd like to thank my uh, co-organizer Alex, and thank you all for uh, for attending with us um, this morning. Hopefully, you found um, the sessions informative. As I said, now the um, the slides that we used today were will be posted on the RDA site in the coming days and also um, a link to this recorded session will be made available um, and sent to you via email. Uh, thank you again and I will just close today's session and hopefully uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your weekend whenever whenever it starts. Thank you, bye now. Thank you, bye.